Jeffrey show. I'm Donald Jeffries. Um, I guess uh, somebody I've been trying to get for a long time, and I, I'm just pleased as can be to be talking to Doug Horn. Doug Horn is a, was a veteran of the U.S. Navy, served there for a very long time. Uh, he worked originally as a staffer on the Assassination Records Review Board, which uh, I think most of you know was created in the wake of Oliver Stone's 1991 film JFK. He gradually took on more responsibility and was instrumental in a lot of the crucial work that the ARRB did, and he uh, ended up producing five very important volumes of Inside the ARRB uh, that we're going to talk ex- at length about. Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight and uh, flattered that you wanted to talk to me. Thanks. Well, I, 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 I'm sure there are probably others that are, would, would love to talk to you as well, so I, I'm honored. But um, let's talk a little bit about how you I, I told you a little bit before on air I go back a long time as a teenager I've been interested in this uh, I've been obsessed with the JFK assassination for, for a very long time I don't get the sense that you were until so how first of all how did you did you have an interest in the subject before you got onto the ARRB uh, did it grow exponentially once you got there explain the process how you became interested in the subject well actually I did have a strong interest I I was uh, I was you know grabbed or captivated by some of the early books written by the critics. So the early, the three books that stand out to me in my mind that I actually read when I was pretty young were uh, uh, Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, which although, you know, to me it didn't solve the case, it certainly told me what was not true. And it told me the official story could not be true. And Six Seconds in Dallas, the first attempt to treat it scientifically, and uh, and then uh, Sylvia Marr's book, Accessories After the Fact, was a real eye-opener. So I never did read the Epstein book, but those three books kind of got me hooked. And then there was another one in 75 by Robert Sam Anson, a uh, Texas yes. journalist. I thought that was a very good They've overview. killed the president, yes, yes. Yeah, about what happened in Daily Plaza and how strange it all was. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was it was Lifton's book in 81, that really captivated my interest in the medical evidence. I, I had a personal desire to know how much of that might be true and how much of it might not be true, his hypothesis. And I was just really interested in the medical evidence because it was a big mess. And then Oliver Stone's movie really you know, put a stranglehold on me and a lot of people in terms of reviving our interest and strengthening it. So uh, I, I had my, you know, you had your Mark Lane experience in the mid 70s. Well, I had my first uh, JFK research symposium experience in 1993. So on the 30th anniversary of the assassination, I went to my first conference and man, it was a big one, uh, in Dallas. And there were about over 600 people there in the audience. That That's huge for an in-person conference where you have to fly in on an airplane and pay for a hotel. Mm-hmm. And that was the time period when uh, during the conference they dedicated Dealey Plaza, the government did as a national historic landmark, and there was a big ceremony for that, which was a little strange. And so that really got me interested. I got to meet a lot of my favorite uh, authors and get them to sign my books. Heard a lot of really interesting, stimulating discussions. Then I went to another conference in Washington, D.C. in 94. It was the COPA conference, Coalition on Political Assassinations. And the speaker on the last day was this fellow named Judge Thunheim. And as it turned out, he was the uh, head of the five-panel review board uh, that had just gotten underway to try to locate and declassify records within the government on the assassination. So he gave his stump speech, as it were, to the audience at the COPA convention in 94. I think it was Columbus Day. And uh, 
And so uh, someone asked, are you still hiring staff? And he said, yes, we are. Uh, he told us they had gotten some seed money from the Clinton administration to get started. And uh, all they had right then was the five board members and three or four staff members, administrative types. So, yes, they were going to hire people. And the, the first thing he said that was uh, kind of a shock to me, he says, we're not only we're not allowed to hire people that worked for previous investigations because we don't want there to be any apparent conflict of interest, but we're not allowed to hire people who are currently working for the federal government. And I I heard that and I went gulp because I was really interested in applying. Uh, and so I thought, oh, what the heck, uh, I'm going to apply anyway. So I went uh, back to my hotel room. I actually borrowed a typewriter from the hotel typed up a resume, and I went to the first public hearing of the review board the very next day. It was in the old National Archives building on the fifth floor in the auditorium, and you had the five board members on stage questioning all uh, many of the leading lights at the time in the research community or up-and-coming leading lights, and, uh, and their job is to try to determine, well, what should we call an assassination record? When we tell the government to do searches, what, how should we define that? So that's what that hearing was about. And I turned in my resume to the staff director, David Marwell. He was one of the few staff members that had been hired already. And then that commenced a long, uh, I would say, six-month-long period of job interviews on the phone. Because at the time, I was working in Hawaii. I was still a Navy civil servant. Uh, working in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. I was not on active duty anymore, but I was uh, still had a Navy job and a nice, comfortable lifestyle out there and uh, 23% cost of living allowance to help me survive in that high-cost environment and a beautiful place to live and a nice job, a lifetime job, uh, taking care of ships. And, uh, and uh, there I was, embarked on this adventure. And lo and behold, after five or six of these interviews on the phone, which were rather daunting, I must say. Uh, uh, I finally was got a job offer to to work for the military records team. And uh, to make a long story short, some of the people on the board didn't want to hire me. Uh, one of them was Anna Nelson, board member Anna Nelson, who who said I was told this later. Who said, "Oh, don't hire him." He'll try to solve the case, quote, quote, unquote. Can you believe that? What kind of attitude is that? That, that they didn't want anybody with curiosity. That they wanted somebody that was stupid and didn't know anything about the case and that wouldn't care about solving the case. So, yeah. so uh, there were some people I interviewed with who didn't want to hire me and others who did. And the one who did the most was Jeremy Gunn. And he turned out to be the head of the research and analysis staff, the head of all the analysts, which were about two-thirds of the staff. And he also became the general counsel. So he won the battle on that, and I got hired because I had prior military experience and because I had read a lot of the so-called literature from the research community, from the so-called research community. And uh, they wanted somebody who was familiar with the issues who would know what records to search for just from having read all of these books. And he also wanted some, this was his private agenda. He wanted somebody interested in the medical evidence because as an attorney, he was very interested in it and he knew that it was full of problems. And so the fact that I was prior military, you know, he could hire me as an analyst on the military records team. It was a small team of just four or five people. Uh, and uh, he also knew that I, I knew as much as any lay person could know at that time about the problems and the medical evidence. So that's the long story of how I got hired. And if I can keep going, when I got there, sure. it was quite a shock to me, uh, the environment I walked into, because we, here's a staff of, uh, which varied from 25 to 30 people only. It was a small staff. There was a CIA team, an FBI records team, a military records team, and the all other. The other included Secret Service and uh, odds and ends agencies. And uh, what I found out that was uh, at least half of the staff, I would say more, didn't have a lifelong interest in the assassination and knew almost nothing about it. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it turned out that uh, that was an intentional policy by David Marwell, the staff director, who was Jeremy's boss. He was the big boss of the staff, and he was the link between the staff and the five board members. And uh, he didn't want people that had an agenda or an axe to grind. That was his stated reason for not hiring uh, people that had a lot of interest. Uh, it turned out, I think, uh, the real reason was uh, that was the board members' policy. They didn't want zealots on the staff trying to solve the assassination, uh, believe it or not. Uh, okay. And uh, Marwell himself, although he claimed to be an agnostic about the assassination, he had been a friend of Gerald Posner's for a couple of years in uh, yeah. Germany and thought his book was a good book at one point and even said so to the National Observer during an interview. And so he was very skeptical about JFK researchers in general and about their theories and books. So I got hired into a really strange environment, and I was one of only maybe four or five people on the staff who really already knew a lot about the evidence and a lot about the problems with the evidence. And over half of those people were very young, just out of college, or just out of law school and didn't know much about it and didn't care much about it to them. It was a resume builder. Well, I, I, you know, just from reading your books, what I remember what really stands out is that you were really kind of a lone wolf. You, you were kind of by yourself in terms of uh, what I would call looking out, looking at things the right way, because I mean, it doesn't, you know, that once you look into this, it doesn't take a whole lot of delving to realize, wow, this official story is whatever happened. The official story is ridiculous, and it doesn't take that's very long. Right. To fi- it that's doesn't right. very long whatever to figure happened. that out. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Right. it doesn't long to figure that out. So, but it, I, I get the sense that because you talk a little bit about maybe your frustrations with Jeremy Gunn, but I mean, uh, he apparently was maybe your closest ally that you thought you might have a chance with. He ended up hiring you, but I don't. I didn't get the sense that anybody else there was really on the same wavelength you were. Uh there was one person who was halfway there in terms of his natural curiosity, his knowledge of the evidence, the broad tapestry of the evidence, and his uh, interest, just interest in everything. And that was Joe Freeman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he, 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 uh, he became the expert on the HSCA records, the House Select Committee's records, mm-hmm. and the Warren Commission's records, which turned out to be very useful for us. Because it was our job to make sure that all of their files were released or, or, and declassified to the maximum extent possible. So Freeman was a curious fellow, and there were uh, three or four others, uh, but they weren't the, uh, the three or four others were not in positions of responsibility. So it, thank God, uh, just for the sake of history, that Jeremy Gunn and I, the general counsel and I, had a strong interest in the medical evidence because we ended up doing those uh, 10 depositions of autopsy witnesses uh-huh. and then later at the end uh, that's another story I mean I have time to get into that tonight but later at the end there was kind of a last minute uh, oh let's go down to Dallas and depose five of the Dallas doctors all at the same time in the same room <laughs> which is not the way you're supposed to do those things <laughs> but that that was done as an afterthought because of pressure from the research community uh, they were unhappy that we hadn't done that and so was oh, I uh, like this. but but thank God the board members See, they let us play in our sandbox and do these depositions incrementally, a couple at a time, on a not-to-interfere basis with the main job, which was looking for records and getting those records declassified. So the reason the board members let us do that is Congressman Lou Stokes, Louis Stokes of Cleveland, who Mm -hmm. had been the chairman of the House Select Committee after the first chairman was uh, let go. (laughs) Gonzalez, absolutely. Yeah. Gonzalez, yeah. Gonzalez, Henry He's Gonzalez. a strange guy. He started out well and ended badly. Uh, but yeah. uh, uh, so Stokes had told the board members that he knew that nobody was satisfied with the work the House Select Committee did on the medical evidence, and he encouraged them to clarify the record as much as they could. That was his magic phrase that Jeremy and I hung our hats on <laughs> for the next two and a half years. So we weren't allowed to reinvestigate the assassination, you know, at the review board. M- many of your listeners may not know that. We weren't allowed to do a reinvestigation. We weren't allowed to come up with findings of fact. The Congress had uh, done an investigation and had not satisfied really anybody because they basically said, well, as you will recall, they said, well, we think it's a probable conspiracy, 
but we don't know who did it, and they shut down. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, that didn't make anybody happy, and they, and Stokes knew they had not made anybody happy with their work on the medical evidence. So uh, Jeremy and I proceeded to try to clarify the record of the medical evidence where we knew there were massive conflicts and questions that were unanswered by doing unsworn interviews, just interviewing everybody we could who thought might have something meaningful to say, especially if they'd been involved in creating records. Like right. the x-ray text of the autopsy. X-rays are records. And the two autopsy, well, the two FBI agents who are at the autopsy. Uh, who yep. created a record. Yes, yeah, Cybert and O'Neill wrote yep. an FBI 302 report, which turned out to be very famous because it contradicts the autopsy report. So they they were important. So that's what we were doing was trying to clarify the record. By And, and by the way, we weren't allowed to write conclusions of fact saying, well, this is what all these 20 or 30 people said, and this is what it means. Oh, no. That argument would still be going on today if we had been trying to determine what does it mean what all these people said. <laughs> uh, so we, we had to dump all these interview reports and these deposition transcripts in the archives for the American people to assess on their own, and uh, which is why I ended up writing this incredibly long book, because I realized after you know I wasn't working there anymore, after we shut down, that... Uh, Nobody's going to know about these things uh, uh, unless somebody writes about it. Uh, nobody has time to go to the archives for two or three weeks at a time and sit in a reading room and say, okay, I want to read the depositions of the three autopsy pathologists, Humes, Boswell, and Fink. And they could even sit there and read those and take four days to read them. But would they know what those guys said earlier? Would they know what those people said to the House Committee, and would they know what they said to the Warren Commission, and would they know how they may have contradicted themselves over the years, or how they gave lousy answers to some of the questions, and no one on those organizations followed up and forced a decent answer out of these guys. So that's why I wrote the book, was to not only you know report what all these new witnesses said, uh, but to put it in the context of what they said previously and what other people were saying. Absolutely. Well, I want to, the, the, the chat room uh, has several questions for you, and they all revolve around the Zapruder film. What is the first piece of evidence you would offer to evaluate the authenticity of the Zapruder film? Did Zapruder know Du Morenschild? And if so, is that fishy? Has Doug heard of the infamous other Zapruder film or similar films shot from the pergola or Zapruder's general area? And if you could talk about the two sets of presentation boards produced from the alleged Z film or films. Yeah, well, let's let's let me stick to the. Uh, I, I have no idea whether Demore and Shield knew Zapruder. Uh, all I know is Zapruder didn't even bring his camera to work, and his secretary forced him to go home and get it. So yeah. Marilyn Sitzman, you know. Yes. So I'm glad he went home and got it, in spite of the controversy about the film. Uh, yes, I've heard about the other film that people have seen. I've talked to some of the one of the people who's seen the other film is Greg Burnham. Yes, yes. And they they all seem to have something in common. They they describe two things that are not in the film today. They describe a brief car stop uh, on Elm Street for the limousine, and they describe, uh, before that, they describe the car on the film turning the corner from Houston onto Elm. In other words, not just appearing magically in the middle of Elm Street, which we see today. It's a big jump cut. Mm -hmm. The film cuts from motorcycle, lead motorcycle cops. All of a sudden, the, the car is suddenly there. It's like, okay, what did it, it just beamed down, right? So uh, so they recall seeing it, uh, it turn the corner, and they recall seeing a brief car stop. And the reason I tend to believe some of these people who saw the other film is because, I'll try to keep this short, is because uh, there are two audio records from the day of the assassination that I have. I mean, people have provided me with these sound bites from TV. And one is Walter Cronkite saying, uh, the car stopped in the middle of the shooting. Yeah. And now I know that Walter Cronkite wasn't there, but somebody who was there was telling him this on the phone. Well, 50, 59, 59 witnesses, I believe. Right. And, and so, phone, yeah. and so, uh, yes, that's right. And so that what he's saying isn't just Walter Cronkite. He's corroborating on the air what about 59 other people said. 
And the other one is more persuasive. It's Bob Clark, who was with ABC News and was in one of the open convertibles behind the Queen Mary, uh, a little bit behind LBJ's car, not too far back. And uh, because the press bus was canceled, conveniently canceled by somebody, <laughs> yes. Yes. some conspirator canceled that because it would have been right ahead of the limousine, you know. Yep. Yep. And, well, the flat. Well, excuse me. The flatbed truck with the cameras on it is what was canceled. Right. Uh, the flatbed truck was canceled. So, so anyway, the the members of the press, instead of being in front of the limo, looking back at it with their cameras going, were were way behind it. So Bob Clark was there, and he said on, uh, on an interview, and I've got that audio that. Uh, the limousine stopped in the middle of the shooting. So that's, and he was there, so he wasn't recounting hearsay. So he's one of those, he's that 59 plus one person. Uh, so, so, uh, so look, uh, I became the, uh, gradually, uh, the point man for the staff at Jeremy Gunn's request for our efforts to look into authenticity of the Z film. And uh, so a a study was commissioned by a retired Kodak chemist named Raleigh Zavada. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeremy and I learned a lot of the basics that we learned about 8mm film uh, and about Zapruder's camera from Raleigh Zavada. He did a big study on how the camera worked. And he did uh, a basic study on simple things like the edge print on the film. Some of the edge print is, uh, is put in in the factory. It's factory date code. The date code of the, f- the film was made, which was 1961. And other edge print indicates where it was developed, i.e. Dallas. Uh, he didn't go much beyond that in his big, massive study. He didn't get into uh, image content or anything else. Uh, he just studied edge print, date code, and explained how the camera worked. Uh, but he gave us a good education in the basics of film. And then Moses Weitzman, the man who made the Robert Groden film, I mean, Moses Weitzman was in charge of a New York film lab. Uh, the owner at the time, uh, Time Life, came to him in 68, I believe it was, and said, we've got this 8 millimeter film. We want you to blow it up to 35 millimeter." And we're going to do a big documentary on all the assassination films. Well, they ended up canceling that project, but uh, he did a he did use an Oxbury optical printer and blow the film up directly with lenses, you know, from eight to thirty-five millimeter. And he gave them his best copy of that, and he had a couple of discards that he wasn't totally happy with, and that's what Robert Groden ended up with was the discards. And I'm glad he did. Uh, because uh, that's what Oliver Stone used in his movie was Robert Groden's film element. You know, now Robert Groden has some really shaky, crummy 16 millimeter film elements, but that film element, his 35 millimeter uh, inner negative, is really incredible. It's very well done, and so I'm, you know, that's. So we learned a lot about. Uh, how can I wrap this up? We learned a lot about film from Moses Weitzman. In Raleigh, Zavada, and then uh, all the, you know, I wrote this massive uh, 200-page chapter on the Zapruder film in my book, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is research I did on my own afterwards. Some of it quotes Zavada's report, but a lot of it's work I did afterwards, learning about visual effects, and working with these people that I met in Hollywood, who brought me into their research. So, uh, without. Without getting into too much detail, this is a one-hour uh, chat, right? Right. Okay, let me let me see if I can wrap up the Z film here in five or six minutes. Okay. Because then I want to talk about the most important thing about the medical evidence after that. Gotcha. Uh, uh, I became fascinated in the chain of custody of the Zapruder film Be, uh, because uh, – on the review board, we discovered two CIA people who had worked with the motion picture film on the weekend of the assassination and worked with it in terms of uh, putting it in an enlarger and making inner negatives of individual frames and making prints to put on briefing boards. So that was Homer McMahon and his assistant, Ben Hunter. And we interviewed them extensively. And, uh, 
what I didn't know then, which I learned later, was that they were working on event number two that weekend. So at the time, we thought, oh, okay, this is the NPIC, National Photographic Interpretation Center. That's the big CIA uh, film lab in Washington, D.C., in the Navy Yard. Uh, that was what it was called then. And uh, they made prints from the movie for pasting on briefing boards to brief government officials. And they did this work. It was very clear. They did it Sunday night, we thought, because they said we did this late at night, a couple of days after the assassination, but before the funeral. So if you if you take that literally, a couple of a couple of nights after the assassination and before the funeral is Sunday night. Uh, and so I thought, well, that's really interesting because the film was supposed to be in Chicago then, and obviously whatever they had wasn't in Chicago, and did they have the original? Of course, Homer McMahon said, yes, I thought it was. So later on when I'm writing my book, this is in 2009, so I interviewed McMahon and Hunter in 97, and there are tape recordings of the, uh, of the McMahon interview, the big one, and then written uh, reports of, of another interview with him on the phone and his assistant, Ben Hunter. Anyway, uh, in 2009, I was contacted by Peter Janney, uh, who wrote Mary's Mosaic. And Peter Janney, uh, his father had been a CIA employee uh, and had known Dino Brugioni. Now, Dino Brugioni was a big cheese at the NPIC in Washington at this facility. Uh, the National Photographic Interpretation Center. He was the chief of information. He was in charge of all the briefing boards that were made for government officials. That's a big job. And he was one of the plank owners who founded the outfit in uh, 55 or 56 or whenever it was. So uh, it, it turned out Peter Janney did several interviews of Dino, and it turned out that Dino also handled the Zapruder film movie, The Weekend of the Assassination. And so when Peter Janney contacted me in the cold in 20, 2009, I'm trying to finish my book, and I didn't know if I was going to write about the Z film or not, and I finally decided I can't dodge it. It's too important. And then he calls me. And so he tells me the things Dino was saying, and I said, you know, this, this is really weird. This sounds like a totally different event than the other two guys we interviewed. But it's in the same building, and it's the same weekend. So uh, I kept feeding Peter questions, and he kept asking Dino additional questions through a series of five or six different long phone interviews. And he recorded them uh, on MP3 format. And so I wrote about these two events at the, at the NPIC, the two NPIC events with the Zapruder film. And what it turns out is this. You had a compartmentalized operation going on that weekend when the film is supposed to be in Chicago. Obviously, it's not. Okay, uh, I know. I know the camera original film was sold to Dick Stolle on Saturday, the day after the assassination. I know he put it on a plane to Chicago. I know that. But after I went to Chicago, I'm telling you, it was diverted to Washington D.C., and it arrived Saturday night at about 10 p.m. at the front door at NPIC. And Dino Brugioni, basically the the second most important guy in the outfit was in charge that night, and he had with him two key officials. And uh, Dino was sure he had a camera original film, and uh, they had to go out and buy an 8mm projector, open up a store downtown and buy it, and uh, started looking at it shortly before midnight. And then they, they made enlargements, and they made prints for briefing boards uh, Saturday night late into early Sunday morning. And then, and that's fine. Government officials are going to want to see that. They're going to want to see what happened and see pictures on a briefing board. Okay, fine. The two agents that flew in with the film had just come from the airport. This is Saturday night now at 10 p.m. They had not seen it yet, and they came directly from the airport. So uh, they left about 3 a.m. and took the film with them. And he doesn't know where they went. But I know where they went, because I've reconstructed all this, and it's in my book. They took the film to Rochester, to Kodak headquarters, 
to a facility called the Hawkeye Plant. The CIA had a code name for it called Hawkeye Works. That was their little code name that they were so nervous about, they didn't even want us to mention that in a memo at the time. Uh, and so what happened Sunday night is the film was brought back to Washington from Rochester. There's a Pruder film, but it's a different version. I'm convinced of that. It's an altered version of the film. Brought to Washington Sunday night, 24 hours later. And uh, the guy that brings it is one Secret Service agent, not two. He uses a pseudonym, Bill Smith. We determined there was no Bill Smith in the Secret Service at that time. And uh, he told them a bunch of lies. He told Homer McMahon and Ben Hunter, the, the people that did In Pick Event Number 2, a bunch of lies. He told them the original film had been developed in Rochester, which was not true. It was developed in Dallas. He told them that it was donated for free by a patriotic citizen, which was not true, because the Pruder's whole attitude was, I'm going to get all the money I can for this film. That's what he told his business partner, Erwin Schwartz. So uh, what you had was an 8 millimeter original film viewed by Dino Saturday night. Sunday night, the film shows up again, and a whole different work crew is called into the building. Dino is excluded. The two people he worked with were excluded. A different work crew is called in. That's called a compartmentalized operation. And the film they get is, a, is mimicking a camera original film. It's a 16 millimeter wide double eight film that has not been slit yet. And Homer McMahon uh, remembered the opposing image strips going different directions and looking at them in the enlarger. And, and he, he thought it had the characteristics of a camera original film that hadn't been slit down the middle yet. Except we know the true original was slit down the middle Saturday when Dino got it. Dino was sure he had the original. He said it was needle sharp. So, so anyway, a second set of briefing boards is made Sunday night for the government with this film that came from Rochester. And that's the only one that survives today. The first set of briefing boards made by Dino Saturday night, uh, there were two sets. McCone, John McCone kept one, and he gave the other set to the Secret Service, the customer. Those have disappeared. And that's a damn shame because Dino remembers a massive head explosion. That went well, three well, or four what, feet into the air. Before you go further, what, what, is, what is the explanation? How could such an important piece of evidence disappear? What is the explanation of the Secret Service, whatever, for, for that? <laughs> Excuse <coughs> Pardon me. Sure. No uh, there is no explanation. Yeah. <coughs> I guess I don't know how to swallow water. <laughs> well, I, don't, I just I don't, I don't know how people can... How, why would you? Why would they not uh, expect people to become suspicious and draw? That's right. So, you know, that's sinister right. implications from that. So not only does the Secret Service not have or can't find the set they got from the Saturday Night Work, but the other one that was given to John McCone was actually returned to Dino years later, and he was told to lock it up. And then when he had to admit that he had it in 1975 during the Rockefeller Commission uh, investigation into CIA domestic activities, uh, his boss got mad and yelled at him and profaned him. What the hell are you doing with that? Get it the hell out of here. So he, uh, he returned it, the, the surviving set, back to the CIA director's office where it had come from and never saw it again, and it's disappeared. Now... The CIA coughed up the second set of boards made Sunday night in 1993 in response to the JFK Records Act. And we had Omar McMahon and Ben Hunter look at that, and they said, yes, these are the prints we made. It's the same number we made, 28 prints on four briefing board panels, blah, blah, blah. And they correspond with what we know in the film today. The important thing for your audience is that not only that the first set was uh, has gone missing, it's been suppressed or destroyed, but but that Dino remembers a head explosion unlike anything you see in the film today. He calls the head explosion in the film low. It's low, frame 313. He said the one he saw was high. It went three or four feet into the air above JFK's head. And when he viewed the film for me in 2011, I've got this on videotape uh, on a digital file. When he viewed it as a motion picture repeatedly, he said on camera, no, no. 
this head, this this head explosion is too brief. He said something's been cut out of this film. He said uh, something's missing uh, from the killing. I said, do you mean the headshot? He says yes. So uh, he remembered a different head explosion and on November 23rd, and he looks at the motion picture film today and he says oh, something's been cut out of this film. So it's pretty damning stuff, and it's a it's a chain of custody story, and it's. Uh, it's essential to whether you have any confidence or faith in the Z film you look at today. And I I don't have a whole lot of confidence in it. I have, I think instead of the closest thing to ground truth, which is the way Josiah Thompson wants to view the film. So (laughs) it's the way the first generation of researchers always looked at the film, that it's the closest thing to ground truth. And that if we study it intently, like we're staring at our navel for years and years that will know everything that happened and that's nonsense oh i mean uh, I, I i you're right it was the bible i mean i remember as an, an 18 year old just getting started i i was able to go it was very heady stuff to the national archives and i had a personal assistant you know i got to look at all the evidence hold the evidence and i had a frame by frame uh you know mm-hmm. screening of the zapruder film in a private room mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh you know this was wow this is incredible that i'm seeing this and the head goes back and but I think, right, you know, right. and you're, you're talking about Josiah Thompson, who's obviously one, the, one of the most vocal uh, opponents of any idea that there was Z-film alteration. But I, I'm sure you're familiar with Jack White. Jack White is the first one who I, I think doesn't get any of the credit he deserves either. He was the first one that made me aware of the problems with the Zapruder film, with Greer's head spinning around at impossible speeds and uh, right. people in the crowd right. not moving. I mean, do you want – because what we have somebody who says uh, – uh, what is the original – ask Doug what the original Z film showed that the other lacked. So maybe just to, to explain the differences between you know, the – I think uh, based, based on uh, what Marilyn Sitzman said, she was holding Zerbuder's waist so he wouldn't fall over, that he started filming before the car turned the corner. So the car turning the corner is missing from the film today. And you don't see a car stop. You just see it slow down. You don't see a car stop on Elm Street. And – uh, how can I make this very brief? There were a bunch of Dallas cops interviewed during pretext interviews uh, in the circa 1971. I think Larry Rivera has done a lot of work with this. Uh, and uh, they all told him that the car stopped very briefly. It was brief, but it was a definite car stop. And one of, the, one of them was even sent the, a bootleg copy of the, of the film Garrison got for the trial which was, you know, a grainy black and white uh, multi-generation copy, which he, I think he, he ran off 100 dupes of that. And that cop got that in the mail from these people, and he said, oh, th- this film's been edited. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, what it's missing is the car turning the corner and the car stop. And so uh, once, once you accept those things, uh, how can you have total confidence in anything you see in the film? Now, now, I do not believe the film is a total fabrication like some people do. I think that's an absurd position. I don't agree with that. This guy really took a home movie, and there are only certain things that the technology of the day could do. And that One is to remove frames optically in an optical printer. That's called frame excision or step printing. Uh, you just make a new version of the movie and remove the frames you don't want to be in there. And that's actually why I think the back into the left is so rapid. It happened, but it, it's a lot more rapid in the film than I think it was on Elm Street. And that's because frames were removed from the film when it was altered at Kodak to remove, you know, they didn't want that exit debris coming out the back of the head showing on the film because that's evidence of a shot from the front. So the problem for those people was that by removing those frames from that part of the film, it speeds it speeds it up when you play it back on a projector. So they inadvertently created a different kind of evidence yeah. pointing toward a shot from the front. With the head snap is very dramatic yeah. and very rapid, probably Absolutely. more than it was on the original film. They did remove the exit debris, but the, the head snap is just terrible. And I think that's why life suppressed it for 12 years. Never licensed it once as a motion picture. Exactly. Never showed it on TV <laughs> once. There for the twelve years. That's called suppression. Okay. Yeah, a strange thing for the, yeah. one of the biggest outlets in, in a free press to do. But I, you know, I think I, I agree with Vincent Salandria, who uh, postulated early on, and I just kind of independently came upon it. I think that they left a lot of this stuff out there on purpose. They wanted 
there to be controversy because they left that head snap in and that's what got the attention of young people like me you know oswald right. was behind and his head is flying right. backwards and super and i you know i j- just the same way with the magic bullet why would you why would you plant a bullet that looked like it didn't hit anything wouldn't you plan it? Uh, yeah, if you and, did, it's pretty stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. but I think again, I call them calling cards. I think they want, and that's what Vincent Slander said. They wanted the controversy that resulted early on, and boy, they got it. Look at list the Z film alone. You have that's the debates, right. the debates between Jim Fetzer and Jack White when he was alive, and Josiah Thompson on the forums yeah. that I participated right. in. Uh, right. You know, it's it's amazing. The, 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 but uh, but I, I know you've probably talked about the, the film more than you wanted to. I want you to get. To well, how about just two or three more minutes on it, and then I want to talk about the, yes, the talk brain exam. Talk uh, about what okay. you want to talk about. Yes. Okay. So uh, so these these two wonderful folks in Los Angeles also contacted me in 2009, and they had purchased from the National Archives uh, a duplicate negative, a 35 millimeter dupe negative of the so-called original film in the archives. They had to pay 800 bucks to get it. It was terrible, terrible, outrageous price. But uh, So they did. And this guy's a video director for at Hollywood. I mean, not a director, excuse me. He's an editor. Tom Whitehead's an editor. He edits motion picture films. And one of the things he does when I say edit is uh, every motion picture film that's shot on film is, is put on videotape and then it's color corrected, and they do all kinds of things with the contrast. And then they put it back on film, and then you see it in a movie theater. So he's involved in that long post-production process. Anyway, he knows how to look at film, and he knows what he's looking at, and he knows the difference between a real shadow and a visual effect. Okay, so they they, they scan every frame of this film in 4K, excuse me, 2K and 6K. HD is 2K, like your HD TV. And also in 6K, which was above state-of-the-art at the time. Uh, And what he discovers is these very dense black patches on the back of the head, just where the Dallas doctor said the exit wound was. Big black patches on the back of the head in several frames. So he's convinced that, hey, this film's, there's something wrong with this. It's been altered. And they brought me into their research. And they even played a little teaser trailer of their, hopefully, forthcoming documentary, you know, which isn't finished yet, but uh, they've now shown their scans of the Z film to 75 people in Hollywood, people who are editors, uh, restoration experts, and colorists. And 72 of those people say it's an altered film. And th- the other three were had a very negative attitude, threw up their hands and walked away and says, I don't want to get involved in this. It's too dangerous. It's bad for my career. Uh, but 72 out of 75 is pretty good. You get people like that to agree on anything. It's remarkable. So uh, I, I believe that uh, some frames are removed and that the back of the head is blacked out in several frames to hide the true exit wound. And I, I also believe that this massive wound on the top of the head is painted in. I, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not the only one that said that. Noel Twyman interviewed uh, Dr. Ryan from Kodak who said the same thing for his book, uh, Bloody Treason. So uh, that's that's where I'll probably let that end up. But I've determined from my own research that, yes, the technology was available then using an optical printer with an animation stand and the technique called aerial imaging on an Oxbury printer with an animation stand in the middle of the printer to alter the film with simple effects like blacking out a wound or painting on another wound. Those things could be done with the technology of that day. Uh, But is the film a complete fabrication? No, of course not. So I just think it has to be viewed very skeptically, and I'll just end up by saying this. Instead of the closest thing to ground truth, I think the Z film is going to end up eventually being the best proof we have of a massive government cover-up. Think about that. If you end up proving that the film's an altered film, then the whole state of Denmark is rotten. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's all I, we have time to talk about that tonight. I, I do have a long chapter about that in my book. And after I wrote the chapter, I interviewed Dino Brigioni on video, well, with a video video interview that Peter Janney paid for. And Sh- Sean, Shane O'Sullivan used part of that interview for his documentary, The Zapruder Film Mystery. But I've got sections nobody's used yet. 
Dino looking at the film as a motion picture, and he says, no, things have been cut out of the film. And he talks about the head explosion being a lot bigger than what's in the film today. So for me, it's case closed. Uh, there's a broken chain of custody. There's a compartmentalized operation. And too many people in Hollywood say the film's a crude alteration. It's not even a good job. So that's that's probably all we can get into tonight on that. But if can I shift gears? Absolutely. Go, go okay. with what you want to talk about. Well, the medical evidence. Here's, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, st- step back from the trees and look at the forest. Uh, there, there was a concept out there during the time of the House Select Committee, and that was the Michael Bodden position in their report, their 1979 report, which is that <clears throat> the main problems with the autopsy were incompetence. That, that was the explanation for everything that's wrong with the autopsy is incompetence of the autopsy pathologist. And I, I think that the issues I wrote about in my book and the depositions we took proved that that's not the case. The biggest problem of the autopsy is not incompetence, it's cover-up. So I'm convinced, and I, you know, I write about this, as you know, in my book, that I'm convinced that those, uh, those two Navy pathologists, before the body arrived, were told what their job was. It's to sanitize the crime scene, which is the body, to the extent they can, and remove evidence of frontal shots, and don't talk about them in the autopsy report. And only report shots from behind in the autopsy report. And I'm sure they were given a World War III cover story, and it's your job to keep the nation out of war and all this stuff. They were probably told that a bunch of communists killed the president in Daly Plaza, and we can't tell the country that. So you have to only report shots from behind, because we got this one guy arrested, and don't report shots from the front. Don't do that. So they didn't. But, you know, wounds were altered. I believe David Lutzen is correct that wounds were altered. But I don't think it happened before the body got to Bethesda. I think it all happened at Bethesda Naval Hospital because the body arrived there in the same condition it was in when it left Parkland in Dallas. So, you know, we found three witnesses that said so. So the body arrived in the same condition. And then the wounds were altered between the time it arrived at 635 and the time the autopsy started at 8 o'clock. So there's almost 90 minutes there. And the question became for me, writing my book, is, well, what's going on with the body during this time? Uh, The review board pinned down that the body arrived at 635. So what's happening for those 90 minutes? So what's happening is the wounds are being altered, evidence is being removed from the brain, all the metals removed from the brain that they can find. And uh, so you end up with a fraudulent autopsy that's the problem not that there is incompetence yeah there was some incompetence but a lot of that incompetence was intentional like not shaving the head i mean that was on purpose uh so look i think the most important thing uh, about the medical evidence today is that there are too many old guard researchers who want to think that the biggest problem is incompetence and it's not it's fraud fraud in the evidence fraudulent autopsy from the get-go and the biggest proof of a fraudulent autopsy, and this is where I'm proud of what I was able to do, is the fact that there were two brain exams. And this is this comes solely out of the review board's work. Uh, it's a discovery Jeremy Gunn and I made, uh, mostly me. I'd like to give myself most of the credit. Uh, uh, my boss had me do a timeline study. Of when was the brain exam conducted? You know, when you get shot in the head and, and die, they're going to, take out your brain and examine the brain later after the autopsy on the body is finished after the brain you know has a chance to sit in formaldehyde for a couple of days or a week so uh we ended up with a timeline that said there were two brain exams there was clear evidence that there was one on monday the monday after the death just two and a half days later uh and that there was another brain exam about a week after that and the second exam was, was sometime between November 29th and December 2nd, probably December 2nd. But the first brain exam was Monday, November 25th. So here's the problem for your listeners. The photographs taken at the first brain exam, which was clearly JFK's brain, never made it into the official record. 
And we know that today because we took the deposition of John Stringer, the photographer, not only at the autopsy, he's the photographer at the brain exam on Monday the 25th. And he told us under oath all the types of film he used and the types of shots he took and the types of shots he didn't take. And then we, you know, we, we let him hang himself. He told us everything under oath, truthfully. And then we showed him the pictures, and then the result is that these pictures in the archives are not the pictures he took at the exam of, on JFK's brain on Monday the 25th. They're on the wrong kind of black and white film. They're on the wrong kind of color film. And uh, they even show pictures of the underside of the brain. And he didn't take any pictures of the underside of the brain. He took pictures only from the from above. So uh, that's in Chapter 10 of my book. It's the best chapter in my book, the most important one. And the problem is, for the record, and for the people that want to believe that incompetence is the ex explanation for the autopsy, the problem for these people is that the same two doctors at the first brain exam, Humes and Boswell, were at the second brain exam a week later. So, the, folks, that is not incompetence. That's called cover-up. So one brain is examined November 25th. Dr. Fink was not invited. And John Stringer, the photographer, told me he caused too much trouble at the autopsy. <laughs> Fink, who's the forensic pathologist, worried about entrance and exit wounds, asking too many questions at the autopsy. So he wasn't invited to the first brain exam of JFK's real brain. He was invited a week later, and once again, it's Humes and Boswell again looking at a substitute brain, somebody else's brain, with a different pattern of damage in it, and Fink is there. And he wrote in his notes, which he later gave to the Army, that the brain looked different at the brain exam than it did at the autopsy. But he concluded that that was due to fixation artifacts. So what you've got is Dr. Fink covering his ass. He's saying in writing, in his personal notes, that the brain didn't look the same at the brain exam, that it looked the night of the autopsy, after I saw it when it had been removed from the cranium. Uh, and so he comes up with a benign reason for that, but he, he recorded that it, it didn't look the same. And so we got two people who say it didn't look the same. Uh, Tom Robinson, uh, mortician Tom Robinson for the Gawler Funeral Home, told us, told the review board, that uh, most of the president's brain tissue that was missing was in the back of the brain, and he put his hand on the back of his head and showed us where it was missing, which is consistent with the pattern of damage seen in Dallas at Parkland Hospital, the blowout in the right rear. And FBI agent Frank O'Neill uh, told us that he looked at the brain photos under oath, and he said, uh, no, this doesn't look like uh, this doesn't look like the brain I saw at the at the autopsy on the body. He said this looks like almost an intact brain. Uh, he said the brain I saw more than half the tissue was missing. So he that's what he told us under oath. And he put his hand on the back of his head, saying most of the missing tissue is in the back. So uh, you know, in the brain photos in the archives, the cerebellum is completely intact. The right well, there's, 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 no, there, there's no blowout. I mean, that, that's the essential that's difference right. here is how do you explain that's what right. all the Parkland people said, the huge blowout of the back, which right. the head is intact in the official photos. Right. So what you've got is uh, a cabal of cover-up artists, Humes and Boswell and their superiors, obtaining a medical school brain. Bethesda was a teaching medical school for the Navy people. They had brains all over the place. They had weekly brain cuttings between them and the AFIP. Everybody would come and watch. Uh, and so they just took someone else's brain, and they, it was cut down the middle. Uh, and that, that cut was represented as a bullet track, which it doesn't look like one to me. And, uh, and, uh, and there's no blowout. So... Uh, so that's a heck of a story, the fact that there were two brain exams, and the photographs in the archives are not the photographs of President Kennedy's brain. They can't be. They've been disowned not only by the photographer, but by an FBI agent who was present. And by the way, I just want to finish with this. The, the two FBI agents we interviewed uh, that we deposed couldn't wait to be deposed. The Warren Commission interviewed them. Arlen Specter interviewed them and, and was hostile to them. And he wrote a nasty report about them and then never took their depositions. 
uh, because, you know, they didn't support the single bullet theory, the transiting bullet. They knew there wasn't a transiting bullet, that there was a wound uh, not in the neck, but in the upper shoulder that went down steeply into the back. Uh, so uh, he didn't like that. So he didn't take their deposition. We did, and both O'Neill and Seibert looked at the photographs of the back of JFK's head, which you've all seen in the assassination books. They've all been, all the bootleg photos have been published now, uh, and uh, which shows the back of the head intact. It looks awfully strange. There's very wet hair that looks like it's been cleaned and washed and combed, and there's very dry hair next to it, and it doesn't look right. And uh, they looked at that, and they they said, uh, no, uh, this isn't the way the president's head looked at the autopsy on the body. So they both looked at, and they both disowned the photographs of the intact back of the head. And the thing that's significant about that is they didn't say they weren't sure. They were sure. They said, no, this is not at all what it looked like. And uh, And these guys were trained observers. And they were both J. Edgar Hoover loyalists. So they had no motivation to lie and to make up some crazy tale. You know, you can't accuse them of being conspiracy theorists. Cybert and O'Neill were rock solid, red, white, and blue underwear Hoover loyalists. And there they are saying these two autopsy, these autopsy photographs of the back of the president's head are not what we saw. And so uh, that's a heck of a story right there. That impugns even more of the uh, medical evidence. So, and there's no, uh, and there's no there was no innocent explanation for that. We we have no. about 3 3 minutes left so I want you to be able to sum up any way you want. If there's anything you want to promote or anything please feel free it's your, it's your time. Sure. I I wrote a two volume book uh 3 years ago about FDR and Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's always been a subject of great interest to me. And it was called Deception Intrigue and the Road to War and you can still buy it today on Amazon. Uh, it, it's probably the best recounting of the revisionist position that you'll find anywhere. Uh, it's very well footnoted, documented, great index, great bibliography. But I've decided that earlier this year, it wasn't that accessible. It was written as a chronology, as a timeline from 1937, uh, you know, through December 11th, 41. And, uh, so two-thirds of the book was a timeline. It was a chronology, and it wasn't the most easily digestible thing. Uh, so I've written another book, which I have just published as of today. Oh. It's on Amazon, and it's called The McCollum Memorandum, A Story of Washington in 1940 and 41. So it's, it's a much more readable, much more accessible version of essentially the same evidence with a little bit of new evidence thrown in. And it's about FDR's journey from uh, regarding, you know, how to handle Japan's expansionism, his journey from deterrence to provocation, his gradual journey over a 14-month period from October 1940 through uh, December 41 from deterrence to provocation. And I, I just think it's much more accessible and much more fun to read. And uh, I spend a lot of time talking about the document I got from the British National Archives after my other book was published. Which, which is a tremendous uh, magic diplomatic intercept, you know, broken by the British in 1941, using our machine that we made, the purple machine, in which Hitler told one of his confidants, hey, if the U.S. and Japan end up fighting for any reason, I will make war on America. And Roosevelt knew that. Uh, as soon as he got home from his conference with Churchill in Canada in late October, excuse me, late August 41, when he got back, he knew that for the rest of the year. That was his hip pocket information. So a lot of the book is about memo written by Commander McCollum of the Navy of how to deal with Japan. Let's try to get them to commit an overt act of war. That's what McCollum told Roosevelt. And then this other document, which is a decrypted diplomatic message in which we know we knew what Hitler's intentions were as expressed to a confidant, as expressed to one of the old fighters, the man that used to be the head of his bodyguard, the SS general, Seb Dietrich. So uh, I think it's a great read. I think people will enjoy it if they're interested in that subject. So thanks for giving me a chance to talk about that. No, that's a, it's a, my pleasure. And uh, we're, we're almost out of time. But I, again, I just wanted to say again how much I uh, 
enjoyed you coming on. And you, you, you really only scratched the surface here. For those of right. you out there, get inside the ARRB. It's volume one through volume five. I have three of them. I can't remember which ones I have. But uh, you know, it, it's, it's incredible reading. But it, it really is, I think – reading for the for the person that's a serious researcher because it's chock full of evidence there's not very much you know speculation there's not you know you're not really uh you know throwing a lot of light and fluffy stuff in there it's a lot of really really hard evidence and it, it demonstrates clearly that uh that obviously the the autopsy as harold weisberg once said he kennedy got the autopsy uh you know wasn't worthy of a bowery bum and, and I think right. that's and I think that's the way to look at it. But it's a, that's a great Weisberg quote. Yeah, I've heard that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. But it's just my my hats off to you. And I just want to say again how uh, you're the, you're you did a lot of great research. And uh, I, you know, we, we didn't really I, I, in the second hour, maybe I'll blast the critical community a little bit. Maybe I'll name some names even. I don't care because they <laughs> they have they haven't been very kind to me either. But I haven't done what you did <laughs> in, in, in particular with the JFK assassination because they uh, you should have been. Uh, like I said, you, they should have treated your research uh, for what it was, just important and uh, just in, in time consuming and uh, just a wonderful resource for any researcher to these assassinations. So, uh, again, I just want to thank you so much for uh, – and I'm, I'm still waiting for the, the – this show is relatively new, so I'm still getting used to when the, the music comes on and everything. But I think it's going to be coming on in a, a, just a bit here. So, again, I just want to thank you so much. And, uh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Thank you. You know, uh, I built my case in my book from the ground up. It's evidence-based, and my conclusions weren't laid out until after I presented all the evidence from Absolutely. John. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of people out there in the research community are unwilling to accept a new research paradigm. And, uh, you know, we learned in 1962 from Thomas Kuhn and his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, that... Most of the old paradigms don't die until the authors of those paradigms die. Once they die, the new paradigms take over. Absolutely. So that's how I conclude tonight. Well, Doug, and I hope maybe we maybe you'll come back again and do it again. I really, really appreciate you being on the show. Doug Horn. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much. time of fake news, fake politicians, and fake fiat currency, it's getting harder to find the genuine article. That's why when it comes to precious metals, I call the team I can trust. This is David Knight for my friends at Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange. Proudly veteran-owned and operated, Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange is your home for gold and silver coins, bullion, jewelry, and more. Prices and inventory are updated daily, so you get the most competitive possible pricing. And when it's time to sell your gold and silver items, they pay top dollar. Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange also accepts and deals in Bitcoin. Call or text the owner, Tony Arterburn, today at 888-667-1836. That's 888-667-1836. Or just go to wisewolf.gold. From bullion to Bitcoin, Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange. Wise Wolf Gold and Silver Exchange. Uncle, I'll bet you remember the time when Benjamin Fulford said that the Asian Secret Society was going to dispatch ninjas to take out the Illuminati to change the entire world for the better. That is never going to happen. That it, never did. It never did, did it? Mm-mm. Yeah, because there's a lot of false promises. It's fools. I can't say more. We better not say and be polite, uh, but uh, there are no uh, false promises at the Ocelli.com no, radio network. That's exactly it. Not. It's truth, the point, right to the point. And this is what I like. Straight to the point. Ocelli.com. Ocelli. Ocelli. Listen now. Listen now.
You are listening to the Donald Jeffries Show. Revelation through conversation. WallStreetWindow.com Gold, silver, the stock market. WallStreetWindow.com Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com Wall Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. Go This is Susan Olson from the Brady Bunch, and you're listening to my buddy, Donald Jeffries, on the Donald Jeffries Show. Oh, Chili.com. Give me a place to dance that I can eat, and I will move the world. Take tiny little of hope, each and four, take tiny little of hope, all in. Take tiny little of hope, each and four, take tiny little of hope, all in. Those brittle will build a current, which can sweep down the mightiest wall of the present and the business. Take tiny little of hope, each and four, take tiny little of hope, all in. Now back to Donald Jeffries. And welcome back to the Donald Jeffries Show. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, Doug Horn. He's uh, he's not an easy guest to guess. He's he's been reluctant to give interviews, and I do not blame him. He uh, we didn't go over it that much because I don't know how much he wanted to talk about it, but <clears throat> I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, the the critical community, such as it is, and uh, I, I don't know how many names I'll name, but. Uh, they are so dysfunctional, and they don't know really important people – not not important people, but as far as uh, – if, if you look at how you – know, all, all the first-generation researchers are gone. Mark Lane, my mentor and uh, my hero, uh, Harold Weisberg, Sylvia Marr, uh, Vincent Salandry that I mentioned before. Uh, so these – Shirley Martin, who was a housewife who gets – no credit. I mean, she's another one. And, and this is the way the community has always been. They'll pay attention to something like Edward Epstein's inquest, which was uh, a piece of trash. It was it was a student thesis that uh, 
was interesting only in so much as he was given access inside the commission. So you kind of see, saw the internal workings there. But uh, Epstein never was a real critic of, of, of the uh, – the lone assassin theory, and later he became uh, what I think is a huge disinfo agent with his book like Legend, and just of course and he was uh, also famously he interviewed George de Morinchild, I believe, is the last person to see him alive before he killed himself, as they say. Uh, so they they would give credence to something like that, but Shirley Martin, who uh, unfortunately never wrote a book, but she did a lot of the original research as a housewife in Dallas, and uh, does not get the credit. She deserved, and uh, unfortunately, her uh, daughter, who worked with her, uh, is, I think she was a young adult, but she died tragically in a car accident. Again, I'm not saying, but you know that that's what happens, you know, to the JFK assassination. And she kind of backed off research after that. She's gone now, but again, I I, uh, I shout out to her whenever I can because she did a lot of research that was unrecognized, especially early on, as did Vincent Salandri and Harold Feldman. Uh, John Kellen's uh, great book, Praise for Future Generation, uh, really gives credit, I think, to, to Salandry and Feldman and Shirley Martin because they did a lot of the work. Uh, and we have some stuff in the chat room. Citizen GX says Shirley Martin was the one who talked to Oswald's mom in the hiring Mark Lane. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, speaking of Oswald's mom, you know, I'm writing Hidden History 3 now and I'm working on it. And uh, I'm going bouncing back and forth between uh, 9/11, JFK. Uh, we're going to we're going to look into Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing and all those things too. Uh, lots of stuff. But uh, one of the things that I've was working, I'm, I'm just I'm really intrigued by Marguerite Oswald. And uh, the more I look at her, uh, she was really the first so-called conspiracy theorist. If you look at it, she was the first one and she doesn't get the credit. And she, I look at the, you know, how she's been smeared in history. I was looking again at Bob Schieffer, who again, and we just, we just kind of, even the critical community reflectively believes these people. Bob Schieffer was a uh, cub reporter at the time, uh, just starting out, would later become a, uh, you know, a longtime fixture at CBS. But why would we necessarily believe anything he said but he's the one who really created him and of course you know secret service fbi sources and so forth they created this this image of marguerite oswald as a cranky uh you know very un demanding overbearing woman who uh probably you know if you look at some of these horrible uh, psychoanalysis things done by don delillo another writer who wrote a book called libra again which is a, it's a novel but it's full of fanciful nonsense like, you know, uh, Os Oswald's mother doing her business in the toilet while he's in the shower. I mean, these are things that, that there's no evidence for at all. He's just guessing and trying to play into an image that he's trying to create. And Stephen King, of course, who, again, I can't stand, <laughs> uh, went him one better when he wrote his 1123, uh, 63, or 1123, a sci-fi book where uh, – he, to no one's amazement, you know, postulates that Oswald did it. And he came up with this absurd thing. And he said afterwards, he gave interviews where he uh, talked about Oswald's mother bringing, demanding he come out in the living room, march out the living room and take his pants off, you know, every, every, I think every week or something, maybe every night, so she could examine how he was developing down there. Again, there is, what would be the source for that? Oswald was dead. And I, I doubt very seriously that Marguerite Oswald you know, said, well, you know, this is what we used to do. And but this is the kind of thing they portrayed her as cheap. And uh, Schieffer started that where she was whining, complaining about herself. But why would anybody believe Bob Schieffer? He's been a uh, a mockingbird media pro forever on CBS. He's a you know, typical horrible shill for uh, the, the, the corporate uh, military industrial complex. So why anybody would believe him? I don't know. But um, Anyway, I, so I, let me go back. And so, so it's shout out to Mar Marguerite Oswald. She really, I believe, should be credited with raising a lot of these initial questions. And of course, she had every reason to do so, considering it was her son. But uh, at least she spoke out, unlike the Kennedy family, for instance. Uh, okay, I want to. I want to go. I, there was a question here, one I saw especially. Okay, and Defed asked uh, about Donald. Why would they want controversy? Well, if you if you read my if you read some of my work. And if you, uh, oh, by the way, let me, let me mention the phone lines. I'm sorry. We, we had the phone lines open and obviously we'd love to hear from you. Uh, call in area code 319-527-5016. Again, that's 319-527-5016. I love getting calls. I love your questions in the chat room. So uh, 
ask away about anything. Why would they want controversy? Well, as I, I touched on a little bit when I was talking to Doug Horn, why would they plant a bullet that was pristine? Now, these are these are not, you know, third graders that have never conspired to do anything before. So they might do something stupid. Uh, these are veteran pros, probably from the intelligence agencies, military, whoever, whatever the connections were. They're 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 professionals, professional operators. Uh, why would they plant a bullet like that? If you're going to try to make it look like it was used, now you may not know all the the wounds, but you're sure going to try to postulate that it was used in the assassination. So you want to make it look like it hit something. That bullet looked like it hit. It, it was identical to the same test bullets that were fired into Cotton Wadding. And again, you can find that kind of evidence in the commission's own volumes of hearings and exhibits, which again, very few people checked at the time. But um, so that's why I say that. And the same thing with 9-11. You know, do you, uh, do you really think that, uh, that, uh, that things could be ground to a dust, you know, steel, wood, everything, but a, ma a passport from one of, the, <laughs> one of the alleged hijackers could float down and be found intact amid the rubble? Sorry, I don't. I call those calling cards, and you find them far too often. I think they like to brag about what they do. Uh, doo -doo -doo. George H. W. Bush was the source of Oswald's developing China. <laughs> uh, Ocelli says uh, LHO's brother Pick said some odd stuff about mom. Though, well, yeah, I mean, you know, and he and he, all, he also, of course, said he didn't recognize Lee Harvey Oswald when he came back from the military. So that's a uh, that is an that's an uh, that's an odd thing. But uh, so at any rate. Uh, you know, JFK assassination is on my mind. Uh, I'm glad we had Doug Horn today because I have been writing about it uh, today. And I, I just, you know, today I was just a little, I had a chip on my shoulder about Marguerite as well. Because again, just reading about her, I, I, I feel uh, empathetic towards her. I think she was uh, feisty for a reason. I think, again, she's she's the first one that said, hey, my, my son worked for the government. She's the first one I, I, I learned today looking back on it. Jim Morris had a great quote from the 1970s that said, hey, you know, uh, or you said I talked to Marguerite Oswald, you know, constantly in the 1970s. She would always bring up the Altkins photograph. That's one of the things I call I call people. Uh, Josiah Thompson's a perfect example of what I call neocons, and they're not the same neocons that run our foreign policy, starting with the Reagan era. These are what I call neo believers in conspiracy, and uh, they, you know, profess on the surface to believe in, you know, that there was a conspiracy, but they shoot down any of the most important evidence that demonstrates conspiracy. So there were no mysterious deaths. Uh, there were no sightings of, a, you know, of, of uh, Oswald imposters. So all of John Armstrong's Harvey Lee theory is crazy. There wasn't a bullet hole in the windshield. The Umbrella Man was just nothing. It was Stephen Witt. You know, he wasn't – Josiah Thompson actually argued with me on the forum once, and he wasn't pumping the umbrella up and down. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what, to, what you can say to somebody like that. But uh, – these people are uh, – they run the community now, and they they have no uh, affinity for the early work. Again, and one, one of the most – I think one of the first things that got my attention was the Alkins photograph where you can see a figure that looks just like Lee Harvey Oswald that uh, are very similar to him, and it's from a distance, but – and you've all seen it. He's standing in the doorway of the tech school with the depository kind of peeking around the corner, and uh, – and it's the exact moment you can see in the foreground, you can see JFK's hands going up to his throat. So he's been struck. So obviously this is, I mean, you can't, can you get any better exclusionary evidence? Your honor, my client couldn't be guilty. Here he is standing in the doorway and you can see the shot entering JFK. So you couldn't come up with better evidence than that exculpatory evidence. So, uh, Early on, even the commission addressed it, and Harold Weisberg, I suggest, if you have any doubts, go back and read what, the, what Weisberg – Weisberg did a great investigation on it. He talked about Love Lady, Billy Love Lady, of course. The, the, but the belief now is that – and this is what the neocons will do. They will just arbitrarily say, oh, that's, that was Love Lady. It's overwhelming. It's – no, no who, it, according to who? When did this become Billy Love Lady? Because I can tell you, you know, certainly – Harold Weisberg, back in the 60s and 70s, was talking about it. So were all the other critics. This was – it has not been established that. The figure looks a lot like Lee Harvey Oswald. The shirt, there are problems with the shirts. But uh, people want to believe that. I don't know why that is because, again, that that's – why give it up? I said, you know, OK, maybe – OK, it's not – it's possible that it's not Oswald. 
but you don't know that it definitely isn't. It sure looks a lot like him. And Lee Harvey Oswald's mother used to talk about that. She always raised that point to Jim Mars, and I think she was one of the first ones, if not the first one, to push it. Uh, let's see. We have some uh, Allah protecting the passports. Okay. And defense says, yeah, I can't stand Stephen King as well. I suspect King's over the top, crazy anti-Christian novel. Carrie, his first novel published was accepted because it appealed to the anti-Christian biases of the people around the publishing houses. King understood this and always knew it. side of bread was butter. Well, King is, uh, and I wrote in hidden history. I wrote a little bit about him. First of all, as a, uh, he's a typical woke establishment liberal, but as a typical woke establishment liberal, he also hates the Kennedys. And I, I had a whole section in Hidden History on how you want to understand why they keep killing Kennedys. The left usually protects its own. They don't protect the Kennedys. I know a guy – I have a, a friend that lives in Maryland who uh, – I mean, you, this is the biggest diehard Democrat you've ever seen. And he always votes Democrat except one time, and that was when Kathleen Kennedy Townsend was running for office, uh, governor I think in, in Maryland. And I, I tried to question him on that, and he said, oh, I just like the other guy better. Well, I, again, they don't like the Kennedys. I have quote after quote from leftists uh, in there who, you know, theoretically, if the Kennedys were you know, supposedly, you know, good establishment liberals, should have loved them. But they weren't. The Kennedys were actually good people, and they actually were, right, for the most part, especially uh, for that crowd, and they were trying to do good things. And uh, they're not interested in that. So Stephen King uh, was on the record as saying, you know, I never liked the Kennedys. Why wouldn't you ever like the Kennedys? So is it a shock then when he writes about the JFK assassination that shocker, like everybody else, everyone on the left in the establishment left, he doesn't think there was a, a conspiracy. Um, question, have you talked to Oswald's wife? I, you know, I know I would love to, but I have talked to Oswald's daughter, Rachel, and uh, she's very nice. Uh, she's actually a big fan of my work, I understand. She, uh, she, she told me a couple of times she read things I wrote on my blog and so forth. So uh, that's very cool. Very, very interesting woman, but she didn't. Uh, she doesn't seem to have a whole lot of interest. I would love to get her on this show, and I probably will try again. But she told me, uh, "Well, you know, uh, why? Why would you want me? I'd be boring." And I said, How, "You're Lee Harvey Oswald's daughter. That alone is not going to make you boring." So, but I tr also questioned her, and she was she tried to talk to her mom for me, but uh, she last time I heard from her, she wrote me an email and she said, you know, it's an, I, I get the idea. Maybe there's a little strain there. But again, it's it's uh, political. Like so much in this country, there's Trump between them. Uh, Rachel seems to kind of like Trump. Uh, and uh, her mother is she said, all she does is watch CNN. And just so I, I get the idea that said something like, you know, how hard it is to talk to somebody who just watches CNN. So I get the idea there's some kind of a uh, which is, you know, again, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's I, I see it in my family, and I see it everywhere. There's uh, there's this incredible divide, and of course the uh, the COVID stuff has really really exacerbated that divide. Uh, and another thing about Stephen King, before I get off him, I really as a prospective writer, um, I despised him from a very young age because I heard some comments he made. He he ended up after he had already been published and was a well known name. Everybody knew his real name was uh, Richard Bach, I think. Um, that was well known in the industry, especially. This guy had a publicity stunt, and he turned in a short story or a novelette or something that he had written before under his real name. And it, shockingly enough, it was published. And he afterwards went out and he spiked it. He spiked the football in the face of all those people out there who have tried and just piled up the rejection slips and want nothing more than the dream of seeing their name in print like I had for so long. Uh, if you have that dream, and it's very, very frustrating. I waited a long time, and uh, a lot of people never had the fortune I did to ever see their name in print. But most writers who are successful, we, Dr. Seuss, um, uh, uh, what's the guy said, Judge, uh, Grisham, John Grisham, people like that, they, uh, regardless of what you think about them, they have the um, – the decency to just talk about how many times they were rejected because they don't want people to give up hope. They try to, you know, uh, in, you know, inspire people and, and they, they want to give them, you know, don't, don't, I mean, that's what I tell people. Don't let go of your dream. I didn't get published till I was 50. It's, you know, it, don't let go of your dreams. But this guy King said basically, Oh, see, I got to publish. So if you have something decent, it'll be published. They'll read it. And that's, that's absolute BS. I can tell you for, especially for fiction, I have, you know, two novels that are better than anything I've written that are out there. I had one novel published, but these two are better. 
and because uh, I was I was older and more experienced, I got more refined and just you know I got got became a better writer. And uh, I can't get anybody to read them. It's very very hard. And that's why every time I query an agent or something, I just said, look, you know, just all, all I ask is that you read it. But if they don't read it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Shakespeare or Charles Dickens or anybody. If you're sending these things in and they're not reading them. Uh, you don't have much of a chance. So, uh, but anyway, so I really resented him for doing that. I thought it was a dirty trick. I thought it was rubbing, uh, you know, in, in the noses of uh, all the the unpublished writers out there. And uh, so I, I don't like the guy. I'm sorry. Not to mention his. If you read his uh, uh, his ridiculous quotes about Oswald, where he just you know called him a dirty name and said he was an attention-seeking whore, which is, you know, attention-seeking whore that, of course, denied what he was charged with. So I, that's a curious thing for an attention-seeking guy to do. But, uh, again, these people like that have a platform, and they don't have a Don Jeffries or anybody else on the other side to contradict them and or, you know, to take them to task. So that's the problem we have, is that, you know, people like me are left with a forum like this, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful to Chuck Otelli for it. Uh, the other forums I have platforms I have. Uh, but these are the forums we have. We have the audiences we have. We don't have C-SPAN. We don't have uh, the major television networks. We don't have the biggest, the big newspapers. And so we can't really answer people like that. So theoretically, I mean, nobody's attacking me. I'm not big enough to attack. But if they launch an attack on somebody, uh, they aren't necessarily able to defend themselves because they don't have the same platforms. So it's, it's an unfair system. And let's see. Uh, the dark complected man in the street is still photos, yet not in the Z film. Okay, where it's more about that. Well, there's there's a lot of things, and I, uh, I wanted Doug to talk, and he, obviously he's he knows a lot more about it than I do. But I do remember the debates that they had on the forums for many years, and uh, Josiah Thompson, and it was mainly between Jim Fetzer and Josiah Thompson, and you know, very, uh, you know, two two of the of the many difficult personalities in the community. And, uh, you know, that's, if you, if you know, these people, uh, you realize why they act the way they do. And that, I think again, when Doug Horn, uh, came out and uh, basically Jim DiEugenio, uh, who is, uh, uh, has power in the community. I mean, I, he may be the biggest thing to, I guess the, the name or the face of the community at this point. And, uh, I, you know, I have, Jim, Jim uh, you know, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I agree with the stance of the Kennedy family, but uh, he has some curious positions. And one of them is he uh, really it gave Doug Horn what I thought was an unfairly negative review. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I think that Doug, uh, understandably, you know, was, was upset about it. And he should have been because D.U.J. has some influence. So. I don't know why people do that because, again, I, I, I would have just said – first of all, I would have given the guy kudos for taking the time and effort because if you, these are five huge volumes of Inside the Assassin. So I don't know how many thousands of pages they all are together, but uh, they're you know, and, and they're, they're not real easy reading unless you're really interested in the subject matter and you're well-versed because they're uh, hard evidence. And uh, but you, you can't read them and, 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 again, just look at, at, the, at the, the, the case the same way. He uh, – you, all I can say is get get them if you can read them because they're it's it's if it, you will uh, back up whatever your research you've done by somebody who is on the inside there. Okay, let's see. Tom Clancy wrote 9/11 and Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julia. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure he wrote 9/11 and Tu Wong Fu. He, oh, he did. He wrote that. That thanks for everything, Julia, or and Wong Fu. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, is James Fetzer coming on in weeks? <laughs> well, you know, Fetzer, uh, I have yeah, Jim Fetzer. Those of you who might have ever read my post uh, when I was posting, you know, regularly on Lancer and especially at the education forum, um, uh, back in those days, it was, uh, well, first of all, I go back to Rich Delarosa's forum, which somebody mentioned earlier on. And, uh, I still think that was the best, forum because uh, it was pretty much the first and it featured all the big names that were around then. You had Gary Mack on there who was posting then still, but was in the process of converting from uh, a good researcher 
over to the dark side because he'd been, uh, you know, I think coerced by the sixth floor museum. And I, I don't, I don't know what his financial situation was. I, I don't criticize anybody, but, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, if we're doing what they might have to do to feed their family, but, uh, the arguments between him and Jack White, and of course, Jack White, Mac and White were best friends. I think they were really close friends. And, uh, Jack White, I just admired so much. And I, I, I really, really regret that hidden history wasn't published early enough for Jack to see, because I know he would have loved it. He had told me how much he appreciated my post on the forum. And he and I were, uh, you know, we had discussions about everything from the Apollo moon flights to, uh, our evolution. And he, he was interested in a lot of stuff. He did a lot of great work photographically on nine 11, but he, he does not get the, and I, if you notice, I try to give credit to people that I think are not get haven't gotten the credit they deserve. And I've uh, talked about Shirley Martin, Jack White. I think when you talk about the Z film alteration, that's why I brought him up. Um, He's the one that I know that first really started talking about it. He did a lot of uh, work on that, and he was a photo expert. Te you know, testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. They they uh, smeared him, but at uh, any rate. So, but Fetzer, Fetzer, I would defend him. He was constantly getting kicked off of every forum because he couldn't. Even though I agreed with a lot of what he said, and I still agree with the, the vast majority. He, well, he's going he's going way more extreme. I mean, especially now he's you know he's into the Paul Paul McCartney was dead thing where the Pauls. I mean, it's yeah. and that that's one of those ones that kind of automatically brings a roll of the eyes, you know, because that that would be really. Out, I'm not saying anything's impossible, but um, that's one that I, I you know <laughs> I can't subscribe to. But uh, but Fetzer did you know some good work and. Uh, he brought a lot of good people together. The first one, especially I think assassination science is, is it really is a good book, valuable book. And the great, uh, Zapruder film hoax is good to it. It worked from another guy who died too young, Doug Weldon, who did some, uh, very important research. And he's another guy that I was contacting a lot before he died. And just, uh, really good photographic work and, uh, and other stuff. And he was a lawyer and, uh, uh, you know, you had a lot of these guys that were people forget now that were in the community made important contributions that are gone. But Fetzer, uh, at one point, pretty much everybody abandoned him on the forums, and so I would always jump up to his defense, even though I didn't necessarily because I'm a free speech purist, I'm a civil libertarian. So it's the I, I see an underdog, and I, you know I'm the guy that uh, when they're getting ready to stone somebody in the public square, I don't care who it is they're going to stone. I, I just kind of naturally jump to the fence because there's nobody else defending him. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just me. I'm the antithesis of the, the bandwagon type of fan or somebody that's joining the mob. I, you know, when they're, when they're getting the torches up and they're, you know, they're, they're deciding to march to the town square. I, I just, I just kind of recoil at that. So that's what happened to Fetzer on the forums. The mob would get him constantly. And uh, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't advocate well in his own defense because he, he did resort to name calling. He was bombastic. And uh, so long story short, he he interviewed me. My the very first interview I ever gave was way back and before uh, any of my books were published on the Natalie Holloway case and on the real deal. His show was uh, new then. And uh, he was interested in my in my in my thesis in Natalie Holloway still is that Joran Vandersloot uh, was not responsible. I think he, whatever, for whatever reason, Joran Vandersloot has been the fall guy in that and the uh, the murder in Peru, which I don't think happened. And uh, I mean, I don't think he was responsible. So, um, and that's a, that's a long story, but, and I've written a lot of a book about that. And I'm involved with some researchers who, who wanted me to write this book for them. And they went to Aruba uh, five times uh, at the behest of the president of Aruba. They knew the Vandersloots. They, they, uh, they talked to Natalie Holloway's mom. So um, these are real insiders, and they came up with some great documentation. But uh, anyhow, Fetzer had me on the show, and he sandbagged me. He just started attacking me halfway through the interview, and he started quoting from Wikipedia. Uh, I was taken aback, and I, you know, I had never done any interviews at the point. So I really never felt the same way about him after that. And uh, but I still kind of defend him in a general sense because I agree with a lot of what he says. But he. Uh, he he has not mentioned, to my knowledge, he has not mentioned my name in seven years in public. Uh, Hidden History was published in 2014. He is he never mentioned it. He, and in that regard, he's no different than the vast majority of the people in the critical community because they never mentioned it either. Uh, they treat it like a uh, 
you know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's that I'm a pariah with that. Um, let's see here. But anyhow, so no, Fetzer, I, I don't know that he would ever be on that. If Jim Fetzer asked me on his show, I would probably appear just, to, you know, just cause I don't, I don't turn anybody down. I don't think I'm looking to, and you know, if he asked me to be on the show, I don't know. We'd have to see. It would be an interesting interview, but, uh, he, you know, he comes with uh, his own baggage. Uh, and on, 6307 S was Bobby, Bobby involved with Maryland's murder. Where can we learn about that? Well, I don't No, I don't think he was, but I think Marilyn Murrow was murdered. Absolutely. And, uh, I, had, I talk, uh, pretty much in depth about Marilyn Monroe's murder in my upcoming book on showbiz on borrowed fame, money, mystery, and corruption in the entertainment world. Uh, it's gonna, I think it's going to be published November 1st. The last I heard, hopefully I'll have more details about that and I'll be certain to be promoting it when I do. William Law, who's another uh, guy who I'll probably have on the show at some point, who I think is a very underrated researcher. And certainly in the the medical evidence, I think he's second to none. He's done some great, great work, uh, James Jenkins and, and, and things like that in the shadow of history. But he... Um, He's done some great work on Marilyn Monroe as well. He's done some really good research. And there may be, I don't know if he's written the book or not, but he was talking about writing a book about that at some point. But basically, I think Marilyn Monroe was killed as a warning to JFK to change or else. And he did not heed that warning. And uh, one or both, JFK, maybe RFK, they might have been sleeping with her. I don't know. I mean, she's Marilyn Monroe. I, I, can you really blame I mean, you know, If JFK was sleeping with people, sleeping with movie stars. So, I mean... Can we really blame somebody who's sleeping with Marilyn Monroe and Angie Dickinson, people like that? I, I don't know. We're all human. But uh, if those were his foibles, I don't think they're uh, very bad compared to what uh, – I mean he, he wasn't you know, he wasn't a pedophile or something like that, some of the things we hear that some of our other leaders are doing. But I, I don't think that's been proven anyhow. Judith Campbell election, that's one thing I agree with uh, Jim DiEugenio on very much, and he – he wrote, and I still talk about the posthumous assassination of JFK, one of the best things I read, read online. And I, I've talked it up many times and talked him up. He doesn't ever return the favor, but uh, it is what it is. But uh, he, uh, Judith Campbell Exner was had very little credibility, and people just accepted her story for no reason. All these things about that come from her or from mafia or CIA sources. And uh, RFK, RFK Jr. in his book – uh, family values, whatever it was that book. I, I, sorry, I don't have the title, but it's a good book. He wrote a couple years ago, and he goes over some of that as well about uh, where these myths, and certainly myths about jo Joseph P. Kennedy's uh, uh, bootlegging and mob ties, which is ridiculous. Again, these these things come from the same sources: CIA, mafia sources, Kennedy haters. Um, Fetcher thinks Kobe Bryant was a COVID distractor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, again, that's that, that's the it's it's kind of a great thing in a way that, but you know, and that's he really is. I mean, I think everything's a conspiracy, but Fetcher thinks everything is fake. And I know there's a lot of people out there, and uh, there's an attraction to me a little bit for that, but I, I think he goes too far. Uh, Bart Sibrel in defense says Bart Sibrel will be a fascinating guest. He made the film A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. He also got punched by Buzz Aldrin. Bart has guts. I give him that fascinating. Well, you know, I know Bart Sibrel, thanks to my friend Bob Wilson, and uh, we have done a few shows together. And I, I will definitely have him on. But he wants to. He has a new book about the moon hoax. I think that's. Uh, I don't. It's not hasn't been published yet. But he wants to wait until it's published to be on. But yeah, I I I think that will definitely be a show that happens down the road. I, at the very least, he's entertainment. If you watch. Uh, 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 astronauts gone wild, which is a video where he's punched and everything. That's if nothing else, that'll make you. I mean, it's great theater to have him going up to these guys, Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins and all these people, and uh, demanding that they, uh, you know, swear on the Bible that they went to the moon, have the guy kick him in the butt, kick, and then have the guy, his son, I think it was, was it uh, Edgar Mitchell, I think it was, and having his son uh, be recorded saying he wants to call the CIA and whack him. I mean, just, you know, it really, really entertaining stuff. Conspiratorial uh, gold. Uh, Fetzer likes Maury and Oprah. Who needs, is that right? I don't know. Uh, did you talk to Cyril about Marilyn Bro? William Law is absolutely great. Yeah. I did, uh, Cyril Weck about, no, I did, I did not, you know, I had Cyril Weck on the TFR a few months back and, uh, I think he was only on for half an hour, I want to say, at the most. So I, I couldn't. It was so much I wanted to talk to him about, too. And we talked a little about John Betty Ramsey, obviously a lot about JFK. I did not get to talk to him about that. But he, he's had his hand in so much. The, I wanted to talk to him about the uh, 
God, I've already forgotten the name. The uh, the woman who uh, was the, uh, the the mistress of the wife, I guess it was the wife of, uh, was it Jonah Snecti or something? A, a really rich guy who was like a pharmaceutical executive or something. And if you remember, a couple of years ago, she was found hanging naked for a balcony with her hands and feet tied. And they claimed it was suicide. I mean, just, you know, JFK assassination style, to say the least. And uh, uh, Cyril got involved in that and was, you know, obviously very good and said, this is ridiculous. How would she do that? But that's the official story. Uh, the secretary, okay, you're talking about who shot JR. Well, I, as I said at the time, more Americans cared about who shot JR than who shot JFK. There's no question about that. We're, we're outnumbered. Um, what about the family of the astronauts that burned to death during testing? Absolutely. Those are, those are the grisms. Uh, but, you know, and I tried to reach out to, uh, to the family of Gus Grissom, the son, and uh, he he resented me. I guess I'd called the text and say, "Who is this?" And I tried to, and uh, I think he resented me calling him. So, um, which is weird because again, he's I think openly said that NASA murdered. And you talk about a story. I mean, this is regardless of what you think about it. The family of Gus Grissom, if you know, is Grissom and Chafee and White. And most people don't know Gus Grissom was scheduled to be. He was the dean of the Apollo Pro, the moon flight program. He was scheduled to be the first man on the moon, not Neil Armstrong. And uh, he was – but he was a uh, a bit of a rebel rouser. And I think NASA was getting tired of him. And he notably, before he uh, died in that fire, he hung a, a lemon on the uh, – the rocket and you know basically say it was a lemon and he he, he was recorded as saying how are you going to get to the moon when you can't have radio communication here and uh so whatever was being and you know i, I i'm sorry if you if you if you watch the late date if you read the work of the late dave mcgowan wagging the moon doggy uh any i was on the fence for that a long time for if you read wagging the moon doggy which is still available online center for informed america website uh dave who was you know died again on November 22nd of all days, about five, six years ago, in a cosmic coincidence, uh, Dave and I just started uh, corresponding with each other. And, of course, uh, Chuck and I's mutual friend, Maria Heller, uh, had Dave McGowan on there on her show so often. And he was basically her co-host uh, over and over again. Uh, Dave did just the best job of anybody of showing how impossible the entire Apollo nonsense was. But here you have uh, Gersom. The family of Grissom, who openly, for years, accused NASA of murdering their father. How was that not a story? And I didn't know about it for a long time. And old Fox News, uh, of all places, had a special maybe 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, which is actually pretty good. Did we really go to the moon? That's the first time I saw the Grissom's family interview. But I thought, you know, this is – what more do you need to know how controlled our Mockingbird media is when you have uh, – I mean, regardless if it has any merit – how is that not a, a story for 60 Minutes or something like that to take on? Wow, let's, let's interview Gus Grissom's widow and his sons. They think that NASA murdered him. I mean, you, could there be much more of an explosive story than that? Nope, absolutely. No, they buried it just like, uh, as Doug Torn talked about, this like uh, Life magazine buried this Zapruder film. Sensational movie coverage for uh, 12 years until it was finally shot in 1975. Um Let's see, space is space is fake and gay. <laughs> I don't know if it's gay, <laughs> but a lot of a lot of people think it's fake. Um, Dave has a new book reissue coming soon. I did not know that. Is that for uh, weird scenes and kinds of the canyon? Oh, he just he just did great works. Um, three dudes nut nut to butt in a beer can flying to the moon. Uh, yeah, I mean it really. If you look at it, it really is ridiculous. Dave McGowan was Tim Kelly's very first guest. I did not know that. Good thing is he – oh, is he dying a lot? Okay. Yeah, I guess Tim – I mean I've been on Tim's show many times as you probably know if you listen and uh, good friend, great great guy and uh, he, he had some great guests. Uh, Jay says, uh, I like Tim Kelly. Get him on here. I should probably reciprocate, shouldn't I? Because uh, he uh, – he's had me on there enough times and I'm sure he'll probably want me to come on the show to discuss the showbiz book when it comes on. But uh, but those, you know, those are lots and that's why – when I talked about Shirley Martin, uh, people like that, or Doug Horn, or anybody, I, I, I just, again, I, I'm for the underdog. Everything I do I, I, is, is to try to fight corruption, expose unfairness and injustice, and I, I defend the little guy always, regardless of who the little guy is. 
And uh, I don't like – I hate it when people get credit that they don't deserve and even worse when people don't get credit that they do deserve. And in the JFK assassination, it's really, really obvious. But Dave McGowan is somebody who in a just world would have been heralded as he would have had his own, you know, uh, his own show and uh, on television, you know, like he's – just like if it was about ratings, Alex Jones, again, regardless of what you think of him, unbelievable entertainer, unbelievably entertaining, regardless of what, you know, whether you think he's a shill or anything like that. And uh, you give that guy a show, he's going to blow away the mainstream people. But Dave McGowan would too. I would for that matter. There's there's lots of us out there that if given the chance to compete with these shills, these horrible Mockingbird media assets would blow them away. But unfortunately, you know, Tim Kelly – Dave McGowan, people like that, uh, Maria Heller, Chuck Ocelli, all the, they, they, they are, they have the platforms that we have, and thank goodness we have that, and that's why it's so important for us to keep the internet free because they're trying to shut that down. They don't want shows like this on the air. They do not want them, and uh, they resent that. They resent blogs. They resent Substack where I write. They, they resent you know blogs like mine. They hate the idea that that, that just somebody would. Uh, just some average person who could present insight and when given the chance again to complete in what they call the, the compete in the marketplace of ideas, the kind of meritocracy that Thomas Jefferson dreamed of. If you give us a chance, our ideas are going to – the marketplace of ideas, the best ideas are going to win out. We all – we have the ideas because we're not, we're not selling lies and the mainstream media mouthpieces – are selling lies. They're state-controlled media. Uh, Don, Tim Kelly did a really good show with Eric Stryker a few weeks ago. You should get Stryker on here. It would be a really good guest. I, I'm not familiar with Eric Stryker. I get these names. Uh, Dave McGowan, upcoming book, Myth America. Oh, Human Rights and Civil Liberties in the United States. Yeah, that's the uh, – that's right. I saw that. Myth America. They stole our – they stole John Barber's title. John Barber and I have talked uh, many times he once he's had the idea to write a book, a little book. He said, well, people would buy it in the airport where we would come up with like 10 chapters or 12 chapters or something on myths, you know, like free speech, things like that. You know, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, a just legal system, things like that, that are complete myths in America and uh, a great title. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know. I guess we could still use it. But uh, I guess Dave McGowan, you tag John Barber, not John Barbour. Um, so uh, it was the very first guest of this show and uh, one of my very best uh, cyber friends. Uh, it's Alyssa's idea. That's his daughter. Well, I, yeah, again, and I know there was a strife between Alyssa and Craig, who uh, is my friend also on Facebook. And uh, Craig had a – you know, he didn't delete me as a friend on Facebook like so many others because uh, we, we disagreed on this COVID thing. And uh, by the way, I found out today I will have uh, I will be able to have uh, Dr. Scott Jensen, who is a state representative and very vocal on this uh, subject. I think he's running for governor now in Minnesota, but he's uh, willing to come back. Uh, I had him on my TFR show, but I think he's not available to October. I'll have to let Chuck know about that. So try to book him as it. But he's a big guest, has a big following, re really one of the many doctors that's not buying this nonsense uh, Dave's original title for dealing, derailing democracy was Myth America in early 2000. Yeah, he beat me to it. Okay, well, Dave was uh, – you get beaten at – well, actually, it was John Barber's title, but um, Dave was a uh, a wonderful mind. There's no question about it. Very funny guy, and uh, I'm honored that uh, I have been compared to him many times online. I, I saw uh, – one of the most interesting guys in the internet is Miles Mathis, if you guys have read it. He's one of these guys that were – everything is fake. I think he thinks the JFK assassination was fake. So he thinks nothing is real. And I have – you know, there's an attraction to me that, a Truman Show type element where – because a lot of stuff isn't real. Uh, it says, Craig still loves you, Don. He was in hell for a while. He was in hell for a while. Okay, well, that's nice. He still loves me. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. But uh, – well, I know he's – I think I read on there he's uh, – He's enjoying life now because his – we talk about the dream. Uh, his, I think his daughter married a, a guy who's on major league now for the Orioles. So uh, that's got to be pretty cool. I mean it's not quite having a kid that's in the major leagues, which any sport fan would dream of, but that's, that's still pretty cool. Uh, should have him and Maria back to explore the weirdness in Dave's last few minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, that, that would be a good idea. But um, – 
anyhow, so yeah, it's 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 uh, Mathis makes a good case that the Lincoln assassination was fake. Well, you know, he what well, not only him, but that was Dave. Dave McGowan was really in those waters, and uh, I, I, the most fascinating thing he did was his work on the Lincoln assassination. Dave really didn't write about the uh, uh, JFK assassination, but the Lincoln assassination, he had me thinking it was faked. I mean, uh, he made a really good case for it. I mean, he – and again, that's – he was a real inv investigative journalist, and that's um, – you know, that, that – uh, okay, let's see. Yeah, you know, when you have people like that, that that make those kind of cases. Okay, I'm just checking the time here. Um, they deserve credit, and they deserve a bigger platform. Dave obviously deserved a bigger platform. But my point was that all the all these people, the the, the masked, the public has not heard of. There, I mean, we we all, you know, there are people out there that know who I am. That, uh, but there are. Uh, you know, most people don't obviously, but most people don't know. And I, when I, when Dave died, I wrote a, a tribute to him on my blog, such as it was, and we had a uh, a tribute on my show to him. And I did have Maria Heller and, and Craig on there. Um, fun fact: there are still classified documents for the Lincoln assassination. History. Absolutely, and the, and the Jack, how about Jack the Ripper? I mean, talking about ridiculous. Why would you you want to know why some of us think that there was royal family involvement there? And I do. And if you uh, read Garrison Journal, S.T. Patrick's wonderful journal that he comes out with quarterly, I've I've been in there several times, and uh, they published a, a long article I wrote on the uh, the Lincoln, I mean, uh, on the uh, the Jack the Ripper case, and it was which is originally I was going to put in crimes and cover-ups, but uh, and I thought, well, this doesn't really fit. I took it out myself. They didn't edit it because I thought, you know, it's not it's not America, and it it just really it really didn't fit with the other stuff. But so. Uh, I was glad that he published that, but uh, they still have classified files of that. So why, why would you be – why would anything be hidden about the murders of prostitutes in the east end of London, desperately poor area in 1888? I mean you know, – and, and the rationale is that it – because uh, we have to protect the identities of our, our undercover assets. Really? In, in 1888, some of them are still alive. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, Craig has the last two chapters of Dave Lincoln's story. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Alyssa wouldn't let him publish them at the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's because I, I, I didn't I didn't know where Dave was going. I mean, I suspected where he was going, but I don't know if he was going to actually come out. Um, and here it well, was. These people. Yeah, gosh, you know a lot about me. I had a car accident about the time Dave passed and it scared him. Say with Potash. John. Pat yeah, you know, I did. I. Uh, uh, that was a weird accident. It really was. I had never been in a car accident uh, in my life, and that was 2000 and uh, I want to say 16. I don't know, but uh, I had driven basically. You know, you're talking about uh, over 40 years, never been in an accident, and uh, I was sitting at a red light coming home from uh, work, and uh, young kid came, no insurance, obviously was texting. Smashed in the back of me. Very, very lucky to walk away from that. And uh, car was total. But yeah, it made me think. And you know, I was listening to you know really conspiratorial disc. You know, it, it was really suitable for the accident at the time in the car CD. But uh, I wrote about my blog in 2006. I guess I did, didn't I? Yeah, boy. He said, you know, I write so much. I understand how people. These people that say they don't remember necessarily – and the same thing with you know interview. I've interviewed I, – I was trying to get uh, Gunther Fulmich or whatever the German guy is to try to get on the show. I, I, I didn't realize I had him on my TFR show. I didn't even realize. Um, but uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's amazing. OK, so we're down to five minutes. But um, well, I appreciate the chat room. I'm a little disappointed. No calls again. Eh, it is what it is. It's hit and run. Hit and miss. Uh, I guess maybe the first two weeks were more of a fluke, but um, that's the way it is on my TFR show. Those of you, I, I suspect several of you, if not all of you in the, in the chat room are people from TFR, so you know how that goes there. But uh, sometimes you get phone calls, sometimes you don't. Sometimes none, sometimes too many. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to deal with the too many just to see how that would be. But um, so, yeah, I didn't even get to talk really about current events because there's there's so much going on now that uh, I uh, I really I, I think America is, is at a, a crossroads. But so so much we're, we we didn't get to this. Um, 
So they'll call next week. I sound stupid. I'm sure you don't sound stupid on the phone. It's one, whatever. But yeah, that's fine. It's. Uh, I'm hoping that someone out there in the audience uh, would feel compelled to call. And somebody else says, me too. Cool. Well, that's good. Well, whatever. That's uh, very glad you survived the crash, Don. Thank God. Well, yeah, me too. <laughs> I was uh, – that would be a uh, – yeah, that that's again one of the favorite ways, isn't it? Especially as, as, as many unnatural deaths as I've written about. But uh, it's not like I'd be the first one to do that. De Blasio talking about mandatory vax. Absolutely, we love you, Don. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I love you guys too. Um, it's uh, yeah, this vaccine thing, and I, 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 you know, don't have that much time left. But just briefly, I touch on. I, I, I imagine it. You know, I'm not going to get vaccinated, and. Uh, I'm finding in my family that this is, again, this is a civil war situation. Uh, I don't know. I may never see my sister and her family again because uh, they're they're watching, uh, you know, the CNNs and, the, you know, the, the fear porn nonstop is pouring out of these people. They're not stopping. They're acting like uh, this thing is just starting. It's worse than ever, which is nonsense. They're acting like the, uh, oh, no vax of the Ocelli case, the Ocelli house right on. And it's, you know, it's, uh, but when you have a big family like I do, Myself and my kids have not got vaccinated, but everybody else in the family is, and it's causing strife because now you're finding we were, there was going to be a birthday party for one of my nephews, and nope, they had to back off because of the pressure from a lot of the nieces and nephews who really, really bought into this fear porn, and uh, so I don't, maybe I'll never see them again. I, I really don't know. Uh, who do you think was the most famous human you've ever met? Oh, God, I, I haven't met too many famous, really, really famous people. Uh, in my mind, probably I, John Barber. He met him when I mean, because yeah, this guy was a, the host, and he's another one. You talk about Doug Horn, but John Barber's another one that should be the face of the JFK research community. This is a guy that was a host and creator of the number one show on television, uh, and uh, not to mention he worked with Jim Garrison. Pr probably him. I haven't met a whole lot of really. I mean, you know, Mark Lane and and Harold Weisberg in the in the in the JFK community. Um, Keep your warp speed poison credit, Cindy Sheehan. Cindy Sheehan's great. <clears throat> and Mark Lane was pretty fit. Yeah, so maybe. I Well, Ventura, I didn't really meet J uh, Jesse Ventura because – but he had me on a show. So I was interviewed by satellite with him a couple times. So I don't know. Maybe he's the most famous person I've ever talked to, I guess. Oliver Stone, I have – Oliver Stone has my books. He's aware of me, but uh, he's not answering me or John Barber's email, by the way. But Sean Stone, I'm, I'm friends with him, and he's been on my show. I met him and had lunch with him in D.C. Very nice guy. Um, <laughs> he says, I've got to go. My Uber is here. Well, go. I'm, I'm glad you could stay home for the, almost the entire show. Huh? But uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just, you know, I mean, I, Susan Olson. I haven't met her, you know, Cindy Brady. But to me, you know, that's that's famous. Um, am I still a Ventura fan supporter? Yeah, I mean, you know, Jesse and I actually disagree on immigration, and I, I don't know how. How does Jesse – again, he, they invited me on the show two more times. I was on there twice, and both times they canceled, right? So I don't know how he feels. But he did write a blurb for Bullyocracy, so I guess he was still willing to do that. Uh, I don't know if um, he uh, – I don't know how he stands. I, I assume he's, you know – open and awake about the the uh the pandemic but i don't know i it would depend on that i, I hopefully he hasn't fallen for that i don't know but jesse you know jesse's uh you know, an immigration he doesn't seem to understand but certainly you know he's better than most of them and uh he was uh, he liked survival of the richest a lot so it was pretty cool so uh, that was pretty neat okay so anyhow that's uh i, I appreciate all the the questions in the chat room. Thanks so much for everybody for participating. Thanks to Doug Horn for being on the show. Thanks to Chuck O'Celli for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I really appreciate you guys listening to the Donald Jeffrey show and uh, be sure to listen next week. Same time, same bat channel. Mm -hmm.